Turn in your Bibles today. We're going to be all over the place, but primarily 2 Corinthians 4 and Psalms 91. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and Psalms 91. Um, what I'm about to say is going to sound odd coming from a pastor, but one of the things that I was talking with Andy before, and one of the things I've kind of learned with Cross Creek as a church, I have learned two things, to focus constantly on Jesus. And I say that to Andy all the time because he's really good at keeping me focused on that. And I have, it has changed how I preach and how I view things. The other thing I've learned is to be very sensitive to the Holy Spirit. It sounds like that's something you would have learned as a pastor before. Honestly, those are two things I was not taught in seminary at all. Uh, I was taught how to organize. I was taught how to structure. I was taught how to puts to structure a sermon and everything and even how to deal with difficult old people and stuff like that but those two topics really wasn't taught much on and so today we start this I want to tell you this that what I'm about to preach to you is something that I've been dealing with in my own life for the last six months it's just a topic that has been coming up repeatedly to me that life is short so if life is short Then what? What do we do with this knowledge that life is short? So 2 Corinthians 4, Psalms 91 is where we're going to be at. The world is crazy. You don't even need to watch much of the news to see the insanity that is going on in this world today. The world is filled with nothing but death, destruction, and disease. And it is not getting better. Every year we do not get better as a species, as a society, as mankind. We are not improving. We are getting worse and worse. Ladies, you don't feel safer today when you go leave a department store or a grocery store. You don't feel safer today than you did you know, 30, 40, 50 years ago. You have to look over your shoulders. Why? Because the world is getting worse and worse and worse. And who's to blame for it? Well, the first person who always gets the finger pointed at them for why the world is bad, why horrible things are happening, is God. Is God gets the finger pointed at him. In fact, you've heard the phrase, if, if a loving God exists, why would he let this happen? If God is so good, in fact, that's the, the phrase that Larry King used to always ask his guest if they were a preacher or a person of faith. If there is a good God, if God exists, why would he allow these horrible things to happen? So with that kind of thought in mind, I want to give you three basic truths. If if there is a loving God, right, why do these things happen? Why are these difficult things happen? So here's three basic truths we need to understand before we can even answer that question. Number one is, the God of this world is Satan. Look at 2 Corinthians 4.4 for a second. In whom the God, small g, if you notice I put that in parentheses, the, the Bible puts it in small g. The small g God of this world, or world system, hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. That God he's talking about is Satan. So all the insanity we see, all the death and all these things that are taking place are the result of Satan and sin. It is his system. See, God did not create kids being hurt. God didn't create child abuse. He didn't create physical or mental uh, abuse on children. That is Satan that did it. And it's not God who's blinded our eyes to believe the insanity of the world. It is Satan that is blinding people's eyes to believe that perversion is normal and abuse is healthy. It's Satan. But why does Satan do it? It's a good question to ask. Why does Satan do it? Let me just start off with this. Look, Satan doesn't hate you. Every now and then, well, the enemy is attacking me and Satan's attacking me. Look, Satan doesn't know you. He's not like God. He's not everywhere. He's a finite being. He is a fallen angel. He can only be at one place at a time. He doesn't know everything. He doesn't know your thoughts. That's what God is. Satan doesn't know you. Satan doesn't hate you or anything else. Satan hates God. And the only way he can affect and hurt God, he can't attack God head on. He loses every time. It's not even a close match. He can't hurt God head on. The only way he can hurt God is through you. Every parent knows the the, the biggest pains and the heartaches you suffer is when your kids suffer. Amen? So the best way Satan can, can affect and hurt God is through you. 
But watch the second part. Why does Satan do this? This is so important. 2 Corinthians 4, 4. The second part of the verse. This is eye-opening. This is the best reason why you came to church today, or at least the second best. The best reason is Jesus. But you're going to learn this. Why does Satan do this? Lest the light of the glorious gospel, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Why does Satan do all of these things, all of this stuff? To stop people from glorifying Jesus. Here's our second basic truth. Satan wants the worship of this world. Why was Satan thrown out of heaven? Well, you only need to go over to Isaiah 14 and verse 13, and it says, For thou hast cast, said in thine heart, I will ascend unto heaven. This is Satan talking as an angel. I will exalt my throne above the stars. I will sit upon the mountain of the congregation of both sides. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high God. All of this that Satan does is to draw attention away from Jesus and draw it to himself. Satan wants the praise that Jesus gets, but he also wants what he perceives as the power that, Satan, that Jesus has. So what do we do then? All right, We see the structure. We see the why. How do we as believers respond? Now, that's an interesting point because this is a debate going on inside Christianity today. Some would see this and say, well, we need to be about social justice. We need to contradict everything Satan's doing, and we need to be about voting rights, and we need to be doing all this other stuff and everything. Look, I don't believe you're not going to heaven because you're good, right? But I don't believe in a salvation that doesn't cause you to do good works, right? Amen? That's what James said. Faith without works is dead. But what should we do? So maybe we should be an exorcist. Maybe we should start casting out demons and fight. Well, you know what? Michael the archangel, it says in Jude, was afraid to confront Satan head on, and yet all these, let's go attack Satan. That's not the response that the Bible says. In fact, here's the answer in verse 5. Isn't this amazing that the Bible gives us the scenario, gives us the why, and now here's the answer. Here's what we're supposed to do to confront all the craziness, the evil, everything Satan's doing. Verse 5 is the answer. For we preach not ourselves. Right there, that takes away a lot of preachers. But Christ Jesus the Lord and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. That is how we respond. So here's the third basic truth. The world needs the focus of preaching, praise, and purpose towards Jesus. That's the answer. To focus constantly on Jesus. We preach about Jesus. We sing songs. I went to a church one time, a large Baptist church, just literally 18 months ago, sat in the service, and I sat there ready, and I just mentally was ready, and I was going to count how many times I heard Jesus' name. It wasn't in any of the songs. It wasn't in the sermon. It wasn't in anything to talk. Went an entire hour at a large Baptist church, and not once did the name Jesus ever be mentioned. Everything we're supposed to do is supposed to be about Jesus. And as we study what's going to take place in the future of the world, as we study that Jesus is coming back, amen, isn't that awesome? As we study that this world is going to end in burning fire, what should we do? Well, I mean, arm ourselves. I'm not saying don't. Um, vote. I'm not, I'm not saying don't. Uh, get seven years worth of food supplies ready. I'm not saying don't. But the answer that I repeatedly see is that we need Jesus. So it's not a church Satan is afraid of. It's not a denomination, constitution. It's Jesus Satan is afraid of. Because even at his name, Satan will bow his knee and confess he is Lord. So it's not a political party side I want to be on, or denomination, or even a great church's side I want to be on. I want to be on Jesus' side. Because he has never lost a battle and will never will lose a battle with Satan. So one of the crazy truths that I have been struggling with for six months or so is this concept that life is short. And this week, I had a couple events take place. I'll tell you about the second one. But this week, um, I like football. I haven't really gotten into it like I used to. But there was a big game on Monday night. And, you know, one of the teams I dislike was playing. So I was rooting against that team. And so I was going to start watching Monday Night Football, and I did. I sat down, made a point, I started watching the game, and right through the first quarter, one of the Buffalo Bills players, a, 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 he made a very generic tackle, it was normal play, he stood up, took a step, and it was like somebody pulled the battery out of him, and he just went down. 
they, they, they rushed the uh, medics out there and they, re I mean, his heart stopped. They said they had to bring him back twice. He's doing better. I'm, I'm glad. I don't know if he'll ever play football again. I'm just glad it looks like he's going to live. That, that seems to be the most important. But it was amazing that all these commentators who are spent millions of dollars to talk had nothing to say. And they would come to them and they, was just, they kept running commercial after commercial after commercial. The whole crowd that had come, millions of people watching, it was a packed stadium in Cincinnati. And everybody was just silent because nobody knew. And, you know, my mind went back to, um, I think it was 1971, uh, Chuck Hughes, the last player to die on an NFL, I think he's the only player to die on an NFL football. It was a Detroit Lions wide receiver, ironically, right? And he died literally from a heart attack during the middle of the game in Tiger Stadium right there on the turf, and he died there, Chuck Hughes. And my mind went back to that, and I'm watching this, and I started texting some people, hey, watch this, are you seeing this, are you seeing this? Look at what's going on. And because healthy young people aren't supposed to die. Whatever the reason, whether he got a vaccination shot, I don't know anything, whether it's predetermined, whether he has a, a pre-existing condition that happens and stuff, but healthy young people shouldn't die. And I started thinking about this, my life is short, so what should I do? One of the person I text was a, 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 a young person who's kind of, you know, trying to experience everything the world has. And I said, you seeing this? And they were like, yeah. I said, you know, life is short. And they're like, yep, and that's why. And they kind of told me all the stuff they're involved with. That's why I do this and this. And I thought, well, maybe that's not the, what life is short. Maybe that's not the answer. Maybe life is short, so maybe we should do stuff to make an impact on other people. Because if life is short, we could, like that young person, just throw up our hands. In fact, like, I'm going to die, so let me do everything I can to this body to hasten it along, right? I've had people tell me that, that are involved in things. I'm like, you know that's going to give you cancer. Well, we're all going to die. Well, that doesn't seem like an appropriate response. Uh, maybe you should just experience illicit experiences. Life, you know, life is short, so like, that's what that young person was all about, getting high and, and doing some things that I won't mention here in public, but... Maybe that's what life should be about. Maybe you should live for money and possessions and things. But when you die, someone else gets them, and you know what they're going to do with them? They throw them away. I work for a business whose entire basic structure is on that grandma can't throw something away and has to store it somewhere. Seriously, about 80% of what we do is people just can't get rid of stuff, and you open up and you look at it. What junk is that? Well, it's not junk to you, it's your possessions. To everybody else, it's junk. And you know what happens when you die? People just throw it away. So maybe that's not the answer. If the only thing Satan is afraid of, then maybe that's whose side I want to be on. Maybe the answer is Jesus. Maybe the shortness of life shouldn't drive you to sin. Instead, the shortness of life should drive you to serve Jesus better. So, one simple truth is this. In this world, make your life count for Jesus. If this life is short, whatever's going on, this world is crazy. In this world, make your life count for Jesus. Do not live in fear of death. Our theme verse, Psalms 91. I'll just read it to you again. Psalm 91. Do not be afraid of the terrors of the night, nor the arrow that flies in the day. Do not dread the disease that stalks in darkness. And again, I'm not sure that disease he's mentioning there in Psalm 91, verse 6. I don't know if it is cancer. I don't know if it is heart disease or something. There's, I don't think that's the disease. I think the disease is sin. I think the disease is because of sin there is death in this world. I think that's what he's talking about. Do not be afraid of death nor the disaster that strikes at midday. All these things, you watch the news and you look at it and you think, man, the world is crazy. You see violent crime going up. You see some horrific things taking place and you're like, man, this is insane what's happening. Well, the Bible says don't be afraid of it because Jesus is in control. Don't be afraid of death because no one leaves this planet unless Jesus says so. In fact, Revelation 1.18 says this about Jesus. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I live, am alive forevermore, and the keys of death and of, of, the keys of hell and of death. No one leaves this planet unless Jesus says so. Amen? And if he chooses, here's the thing. Maybe if life is short, we shouldn't dread it. Maybe death isn't something we should be afraid of. Maybe death isn't the evil we've perceived it to be about. Because when life ends and Jesus says, it's your time, what do we get? Jesus. You know, 
Uh, Billy Sunday once said to a group of, of gangsters holding a gun to him, don't threaten me with eternity with Jesus. And when he says that it's your time, absent from this body, this crazy world means what? Present with the Lord. Death has no power over us. I heard one preacher I was listening to this week and he said, believers never know death. We'll never come in contact with death. If you're not saved, all you will know is death. That's what Jesus calls hell, the second death, right? A separation from God for all eternity. That's why you need to know Christ as your Savior. If you are, if look, if, if your life is nothing more than one heartbeat away from ending, then you better be ready for what's next. And the only thing that will get you ready for what's next is knowing Christ as your personal Savior. I don't know if you know this or not, but the statistics are in. 10 out of 10 people, they die. You are not going to get out of this planet alive. So then what's next? So what do we do with all of this craziness going on and Satan running wild and people being hurt? But Jesus is still God. What do we do with it? I'd like to suggest this verse out of Psalm 34. In this insanity of this world that is going on, in the craziness that has taken place, remember Jesus is still God, and because of that, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted on the earth. The crazy thing that God says in the, in the midst of the insanity is this. Relax. You know me. You know where you're going. I got this. I'm in control. I'm going to win in the end. And when we study the end times, when we study the rapture, second coming, we study and talk about that, that's the theme I want you to come away with repeatedly. Jesus wins. So you need to be on his side. So what are we supposed to do? Our response? I love verse 11. And I put it in two different translations. The second one is the one I want to focus on. It's a non-King James, but it says this. The Lord of heaven's armies is here among us. Why should I relax? God's got his army here. The host of Israel is our fortress. Look, the Lord's army is here. I know specifically that reference in that verse is talking about angels. But I also know that it's also talking about the army of God. And if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, if you are saved, sanctified, born again, you've accepted Christ as your personal Savior, you are part of the army of God. So the answer for the craziness of this world, the answer for all the things that are taking place is for the army of God to fight. And we don't fight with guns. We don't fight with man-made weapons. We fight with spiritual weapons. We fight by loving people. We fight with the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is how we fight. We fight with faith. We fight, look, we fight because we're on the right side doesn't matter what it looks like now. Jesus wins. We fight because we are in the army of God. We fight with the right weapons. We fight like someone's life is depending on us. So you see a child being abused? I saw this in the news. You see Chase Bank? I have a Chase Bank account. But how Chase Bank sort of helped Jeffrey Epstein abuse children? and let them basically funnel his money through them. We see perversion being promoted. Look, I don't know what you believe you know, politically or everything. I'm kind of a libertarian myself with hands off, let, you know, government is bad type person. But adults, okay, you want to do crazy stuff, whatever. That's your life. I guess that's your choice, right? But we're seeing them promoting the mutilation of children's bodies. That's insanity. That's craziness going on. What do we do? Well, we fight back because we are in the army of the Lord. So maybe with all this craziness going on, instead of asking, where is God? Maybe with all the horrible things, maybe God is saying, where is my army? Life is short. So fight for God. Fight on Jesus' side. I want to give you three things, and I'm going to give you three verses that go with each one of them. If we are in the army of God, if life is short. So 
I entitled this, Since Life is Short, all right? Since Life is Short, if you're taking notes, number one, God's army fights with clear goals. God's army fights with clear Look at this verse in 2 Timothy 2, 4. It's on the screen. No soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. Don't get wrapped up in this world, Paul is saying. If you're a soldier in the army of the Lord, your goal is not to be focused on this world, but your goal is to focus on pleasing Jesus. As we study this, we're going to see that the world is going to end in fire. I mean, I'm not, I'm not saying that we shouldn't take care of this planet or anything, uh, but the whole you know, green movement and the worshiping the planet thing is completely wrong. This planet will not end until God says so, and it's going to end in fire and destruction. Pursuing things that will not last, to be honest with you, it's kind of like putting your whole life savings in crypto. It ain't going to last. It's not real. It's not there. So what should we pursue? If you're taking notes, pursue Jesus by pursuing souls. And I mean pursuing souls in sort of two ways. One, be a soul winner. You get an opportunity to tell somebody about Jesus, just be casual, be simple. You don't have to beat it over their head and just say, well, that's what you believe. Well, I know Christ is my personal Savior. Jesus came, he died on the cross, and I asked him to be my Savior, and he came into my heart. And I'm going to heaven because of that. That's how I'm going to do That's what the Bible says. Pursue Jesus by pursuing souls. But you know what I thought about? I thought a lot about those, uh, those paramedics that rushed out onto the scene, that young guy died. If they hadn't been there, he would have been dead. They, they're there at every NFL game, so don't think it was just a coincidence. They're there at every NFL game, but they rushed out there. They were trained. They knew what they were doing. They did CPR. They revived him and got his heart beating two different times. Be a soul medic. I like that phrase. Be a soul paramedic. Where somebody's having issues and problems, we rush in and we help them. Not because it's going to get them to heaven or us to heaven, but because we are going to heaven and it has changed our response to people. Live the gospel and if you have to open your mouth, then do it. That's what our goal is. That's what, that's what the whole foundation point is. Is that we have an opportunity to help people and to help kids. Look... I know somebody might disagree with me, maybe they bristle when I say this, but adults usually get what they deserve. Usually. Not always, but they usually do. Most adults get involved in addictions. You chose it. You got into you kind of got what you deserved most of the time, not always. But no kid deserves the nonsense that they have to put up with. They're just kids. And if we can't have our heart broken about what's going on, and if God opens up a door for us to have just this shiver a sliver of an opportunity to help a child and possibly maybe give the gospel, how do we not take it? Amen? <coughs> if you are a first responder of Jesus' army, go. Run. <coughs> There's an old preacher who said, you know, I want to build a mission at the gates of hell. A lot of people want to live in the sound of the church bells, but I want to build at the gates of hell. And what I see in Christianity, I see churches being planted. I see in this whole thing. We're not changing the world. You know why? Because we plant churches in the South. We plant them in Texas. You know why they do it? Because it's easy. It's a lot easier to plant a church in Texas than it is New York City because there's already a whole bunch of people who culturally go to church. I see, I see church satellite campuses that start. And where do they always start? The richest, whitest neighborhoods. And they, nobody goes, nobody's on the southwest or the western part of Detroit or the east part of Detroit. They only go into Detroit when it's a hip, gentrified, young, white community. And that's what we're doing. That is not what we've been called to do as a church. That's not what you've been called to do in the army of God. You haven't been called to be ease and be relaxed. You've been called to charge the hill for Jesus. And it gets silent not a popular thing to preach. Number two, since life is short, God's army fights with clean hands. Proverbs 25, 26. This verse, I don't like this verse because it's really convicting. Proverbs 25, 26. If the godly give in to the wicked, it's like polluting a fountain or muddying a spring. So maybe you can get away with it. That thing that you know, you've been arguing with other Christians about, maybe you can get away with it and you won't become an addict or it won't affect your life. But maybe, maybe it will affect the way you fight in God's army. 
Maybe it will make you less effective in sharing the gospel. Maybe that's the way. See, I was raised in a very strict, conservative Christian church and everything. We had a whole bunch of rules, right, Johnny? A whole bunch of rules. You don't go to movies. You don't do this. You don't even have your hair long. You can't have facial hair or anything. You know, a whole bunch of different rules. And I kind of go along with most of the rules that I was raised with. Not, not the movie part is stupid. But I kind of go along with the, a lot of the movies and, and the rules I was raised with. I kind of do. But the reason I wish they had taught me, hey, don't do all this, don't do this, not because this and the reasons why. You can give a young person 20 reasons why they should be celibate until they get married. But, you know, you look at the cart of cigarettes. It says this will kill you. And yet people start smoking when they're teenagers all the time because they don't think the rules apply to them. I wish they had said repeatedly, hey, don't do all these different things. Don't worry about it. Focus on Jesus. And if you focused on Jesus, then you won't have to worry about all these other things. Because if my life is focused on Jesus, then I won't be so concerned about what I put in this body. I want my life to glorify Christ so that I'm not muddying up what Jesus has done. Nobody wants to drink from a dirty well. Nobody wants to drink from spring water that's poisoned. I want my life to focus on Jesus. 2 Corinthians 4, 6 says this, the second, third part of our verse that we looked at. For God, who commended the light to shine out of the darkness, hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus. All right, God gave us this to shine to the world. And I want you to understand something. The sun is a source light. The moon is a reflective light. And I used to do this illustration all the time with teenagers, so I'll do it with you. But if you took a nice clear mirror and you shine light on it, the mirror would shine a perfect reflection of light. And that's what Jesus is. The moon doesn't give off any light. It just simply reflects. So when you see the moon, it's not like the moon is giving light. The moon is reflecting light that the sun has hit. And that's what we're supposed to be. Jesus' light hits us and then we reflect it. Well, you take a perfect mirror and you use that light and it shines and it looks really good. But if you take a deformed mirror that's broken and dirty, the light that it shines off is not a true image of what it's giving, isn't it? It has cracks, it has dirt, it kind of hides it. That's with us. We wonder why the world doesn't believe in Jesus. Well, maybe it's because they're seeing a cracked, perverted form of it. If you're in the army of God, how can you minister with dirty hands? God's army fights with clean hands. And not because you're afraid of the pastor or you were taught with these different rules. You do it all because you want to glorify Jesus. Number three, God's army, since life is short, God's army fights with calm minds. So 1 Peter 5.8, be sober-minded, be watchful. Why? Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. So I want to throw two obvious points. These are obvious points about sobriety. First of all, sobriety leads to rational thinking. Okay? I used to love the show back in the 90s and stuff, cops, and they would follow these police officers, and every time they had a domestic dispute or a fight, there was always somebody drunk or doing drugs. They never barged into a home with a domestic dispute, and it was the guy was like, you know, I was reading my Bible, and I went crazy and started hitting my wife. No one ever does that, right? But it's always because they're drunk or high or on something than something like that. Sobriety leads to rational things. You ask any young person, why did you do that? Well, okay, well, first of all, I was high. Okay, that's all I need to know. You, you did something stupid. Okay, well, we, me and my cousin were drinking. Okay, well, that's why you did. I've done some of the stupidest stuff in my life. Okay, we'll keep going. Secondly, sobriety exposes dangers. Uh, the verse compares Satan to a lion. Lions are great predators. Why? Because they're the fastest? No, they're not the fastest of the big cats. Because they're the strongest? No, they're actually not the strongest. They're the best because they camouflage themselves and they slowly surround their prey and they look for them. And the next thing, the prey doesn't pay attention. Next thing they know, they're surrounded by eight or nine lions that come in and attack it and they take them down. Satan is doing the exact same thing. He's trying to get you to... And sober people can see clear dangers. So this is not a, a teetotaling message. I'm not trying to sit here and talk to you about alcohol or drugs or anything else. What I'm trying to say is this. Be more Jesus-focused. I posted this on Facebook just to, for fun. Um, after going through this and getting ready, I posted this phrase. You can't walk for the Lord if you're falling down drunk. That's kind of true. I mean, I could also... You can't... You can't serve the Lord if you're serving money, right? 
you, you can't do something for Jesus if you're so concerned about doing things for yourself. And I mean, you could post a lot of stuff, but can't serve the Lord. So, you know what? I'm not a big conspiracy fan. I, I believe more in government in, incompetence and greed. I'm more of that. But maybe if I did pick a conspiracy, maybe that I believe, maybe it's a conspiracy that we're allowing all this marijuana to flood our culture. Maybe if people are high, they won't notice everything that's going on in front of them. Maybe unsober people do crazy, stupid stuff. Maybe unsober people aren't exposed to the dangers that are going on, right happening right in front of them. Because, you know, a populace that is high and subdued, right? They're not legalizing meth. Meth makes you crazy and do things, but weed, weed makes you do nothing. You've never seen anybody like, who built that bridge? That's an amazing design. Well, first of all, I got high. No, that, that doesn't happen. Nobody does that. But maybe, maybe a, a, a in sober society, right? Doesn't think right and isn't aware. But a calm mind, a sober mind, maybe a sober mind sees truth. Truth that makes you go, wait, wait. Why do grown men need to get sexually dressed up like women to read books to children? What's the point? Wait, that's insane. What are you doing? First of all, why do you need to get dressed up like a woman at all? If you did that for as an, a white person as an African American, we call it blackface. Ladies, this is insulting you. They're not dressed up like a normal lady. They're dressed up like Dolly Parton on steroids, right? They're dressed up ridiculously. But why does it need to be, and they're sexually dressed up. Why do they need to read books to children? That doesn't make sense. Maybe if you have a calm mind, you start to see injustice. Okay, that whole Jeffrey Epstein thing, you know, he killed himself. That whole Jeffrey Epstein thing, the lady that was his right-hand man and everything, Giselle Maxwell, okay, right, she got sentenced, she got tried, she got convicted. Okay, for peddling these children, these young girls, to these wealthy men. Okay, well, where are the men she peddled them to? I mean, is it because some of them are politicians and they're above the law, or they're the son of queens and they don't have to answer for what they did? I've never yet seen somebody who was convicted of child sexual, you know, pedophiling and, and, and sending kids off and exploitation kids, that they didn't go after the people who did it too. Maybe a calm mind seems pain. Look, we, we, we're, do you realize that in America, for the first time, our life expectancy has gone down? And it's not gone down because our medical care isn't better enough. It didn't go down because of COVID. Our life expectancy has gone down because we have an entire generation dying from opioids. This whole generation, millennials and especially Generation Z, things laced with fentanyl sometimes accidentally, but a lot of them are doing it on purpose. So here's a clear thought. Here's, what's, here's just a clear thought. Why are we letting this into our country then? And how many pharmaceutical companies are making billions off of this? And what about China? Why are we just looking the other way as China kills a generation in our country? You see, but if you're not sober, you don't look at these things and see them. And maybe, maybe a calm mind fights back. Maybe children shouldn't be sexualized. Maybe that's just insanity. Maybe there should be an alternative to abortion. And Christians should lead it and say, you know what, we'll love that child. We'll help them. Maybe God's army should just fight with God's tools and God's resources and the way God would have us to fight. But maybe the enemy likes to keep us drunk, high, materialistic, selfish, greedy. You can come up with a lot of different things. It's not just alcohol he's talking about there, about being sober-minded. Because sober-minded people think rationally. Sober-minded people see dangers that are right in front of them. So the second thing about this week that made me think about that life is short is that uh, I saw that young man almost die, and it looked like he did die in the field. But this week was the, the week my dad went home to be with the Lord. January 5th. Um, 23 years ago, went to bed healthy, just didn't wake up. And I'll just be honest with you, that, that, that there's one event in my life. You know how 9-11 changes history? You always think of pre-9-11 and after 9-11. Just getting on a plane makes you think of that. Um, 
but that event, you know, before my dad and after my dad went home to be with the Lord, is, and I've thought a lot about that. To be honest with you, pastoring churches, I have looked out at the crowd and thought, God, why is my dad dead and that person's still alive? They're horrible. You're supposed to laugh at that. But seriously. And I've looked and thought about that in my own life. Okay, if my dad passed away at 60, and maybe I got that in me too. Who knows? Life is short. And I thought about that this last few years. I've thought about the phrase, I'm going to have to answer to my dad. Okay, I bought a new truck. It's a Chevy truck. Do you know why I didn't buy a Toyota? You know why I don't buy a Nissan? You know why I don't buy a Honda? Because one day I'm going to answer to my dad and he's going to ask me, why did you buy that foreign car? And then somebody's going to put him, oh, but you realize most of the Toyotas, more it's made in America. It does not matter. As far as my dad was concerned, you either buy GM, Ford, or if you have to, Chrysler. Those were the three. If you don't buy one of those three, don't park that in my driveway. I remember one time my, my now brother-in-law, when he was dating my sister, showed up with a Fiat. My dad was like, get that out of my driveway. Don't park that little... He had a phrase for it I won't use. But, but I'm going to answer to my dad. And I thought a lot about that the last few years. I want to do stuff that with my dad knew would make me pr- him proud. Now, I haven't done everything that would make him proud. But he wasn't perfect either, so I got that to fall back on. But I am going to answer to my Heavenly Father. I'm going to answer to Jesus. Okay. All this stuff is going on. All this craziness. The world is insane. And everyone says, where is God? Jesus is going to look back at me when I stand before him and he's going to say, where were you? When all this took place and goes boom, 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 boom. Okay, you couldn't change the government. You couldn't make mass global economic things change, right? But you know what? There was somebody in your neighborhood. What about this person right here? Where were you? I'm going to give an account to God. Life is short, right? Do something crazy. Get involved in illicit events. Do as much drugs as you possibly can. Get as much money because he who lives with the most, whoever has the most toys when they dies, right, still dies. Or, right, make it to drive to serve Jesus.